Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And <clears throat> we'll today meditate on and analyze one of the most uh, visually depicted pastimes of Krishna. So Krishna's pastimes are themselves very dramatic. But generally if you look at pictures traditionally as well as contemporarily, there are a few pictures which are most prominent when you think of Krishna Lila. One is maybe as Makhanchor stealing butter. Another is as Kalya Daman dancing on the hoods of Kalya. Another is Rast Lila, which is very common. And one more is Skovardhan. So this pastime itself is very dramatic. And we will discuss about not so much the drama, but we'll discuss more uh, the psychology of the characters. And we will see how through the drama, Krishna rectifies the thinking of Indra. <clears throat> so this whole story is at one level, uh, almost absurd. Absurd means that Krishna is the, is the Supreme Lord and it is by his arrangement that Indra is the king of the gods. And Indra is the king of the gods is, is respectable. And the Vrajivasis are doing Indra Puja. And Krishna comes and tells them that there is no need to worship Indra. So, just if we try to contemplate what Krishna is doing, I will take three different frames of analysis to explain this. First is, say imagine Sanujan Mashtami is coming. And suppose a particular senior devotee has the privilege as the service of say maybe the first Janmashtami Aarti and the Darshan comes out, they do that. And then suppose one year suddenly the devotee is told you will not do the Aarti. And then who is going to do that? You know, somebody who is utterly insignificant. Somebody who is a new devotee whose name also you don't know. Hey, what's going on? First of all, if we are given some honor regularly, what happens is the human psychology is that when we, when we get something regularly, we start thinking that we deserve it. So it's not by qualification we think I deserve it. It's more by just the regularity of getting it. We start thinking I deserve it. And then you don't get it. It's infuriating. So Indra was much more than snubbed over here and it, it is quite absurd what Krishna did. I'm using the word absurd deliberately and I, how I'm talking about this from the perspective of Indra. It was not absurd, it was outrageous. You see, okay, this is the puja that I deserve and it is taken away from him. And then it's one thing if we are giving something regularly, it's taken away and it's given to somebody worthy. But instead of me, it's a hill being worshipped. A hill of all things. What is this? It's suppose, you know, say, Indian cricket team is there, there's a very prominent batsman who is normally there in the team always. And that per person is dropped. And somebody who is not even qualified for national cricket, leave alone international cricket. Club player is brought in this place. Hey, what kind of outrage is that? When, when Krishna wants to, so Krishna through this pastime demonstrates that he can do everything um, perfectly. And there are some people who push our buttons. You just, they just, whatever they speak, whatever they do, it just makes us angry. Now, there are like, scientists say there are about one billion nerves in our body. 
and some people seem to have done a PhD in how to agitate all the one billion nerves. <laughs> yes, speak in a way that is infuriating. So that there will be different people who can provoke, but nobody can provoke like Krishna. Nobody can pacify like Krishna when Krishna wants to pacify. We might be very agitated and we suddenly remember Krishna and the whole agitation can go away. But if Krishna wants to provoke, in everything he is the best. So first he just snubs Indra and snubs him in such an outrageous way that ripple is replaced by a hill. And as if there, that were not bad enough. It's Krishna also uses false reasoning to justify it. What is the false reasoning? Actually, Krishna, he, he tells the Vrajivasis, you know, why are you worshipping Indra? If you do your karma, Indra is bound to give rains. You don't have to worship him. So this is technically called the philosophy. Does anyone know the name? Mimamsa. Karma Mimamsa. Karma Mimamsa, you could say it is almost like it's more a mechanical vision of nature rather than a personal vision of nature. Mechanical vision means what? Say if you have a, a food vending machine or sometimes in airports you have a a food vending or a water vend water selling machine. So now there might be some operator over there sitting, but if you insert the money and then you press the button, the water has to come, the food has to come. So this is mechanical operation. The person might be there to oversee, but if you have paid the money, if you have pressed the button, you have to get it. So Krishna in a sense propagates this mechanical vision of nature. If you do the yajna, or sorry, if you do your karma, if you are doing your duty, then Indra has to give his ra give rains. You don't have to do anything more. So now this is not the conclusion of the Vedas. So here we see something very dramatic, which should illustrates how important context is that here we see the absolute truth does not speak the absolute truth <laughs> so even when the absolute truth is speaking we have to look at the context context is critical for comprehending the content what is being spoken depends on in what context it is being spoken. And many times people take verses out of context to justify whatever they want to argue for. And this can happen anywhere. So here we, we worship Krishna as the absolute truth, but we don't consider these words of Krishna as the absolute truth. Because what is Krishna is speaking here not as an Acharya teaching the Vaishnava Siddhanta or the Shastrik Siddhanta. Krishna is here speaking just to persuade the Vrajivasis. And he uses a specious logic. So, so sometimes when somebody say we are doing this particular service and somebody takes that service and gives to somebody else. And then we get angry and then why did you do that? And they give some reasoning. And first of all, that we are deprived, we are annoyed by that. And if, if the reasoning that they give, that doesn't make sense, then that makes us even more angry. Hey, what is this? Hey, it's like, uh, sometimes it's a, uh, I, was a conflict I was at a conflict resolution session once, and like I was a mediation. So, the one, one person spoke something and the other person spoke. So the other person said, if you want to lie, at least speak a believable lie. <laughs> 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 so, 
so sometimes it happened that you give a reason but it's an utterly unreasonable reason then that makes you even more angry so what happens is that indra becomes even more provoked he says this is a stupid reason it's not even the proper philosophy and then the rajwasis try to save the day they they try to you could say save indra's face and they say yes krishna what is you saying we should do a gordan puja he says yes but let us do this indra puja then after that we will prepare the paraphernalia and then we will do gordan puja and krishna says nothing doing he says there is absolutely no need to worship indra just worship govardhan so it's like another example say some somebody has come to come uh, somebody is expecting some prasad and they are waiting and say we are cooking and he says there are another guest you give the prasad to them he says no no we will give the prasad to this person and then we can prepare another plate and go there no need to feed this person just feed that person only <laughs> and this person is hungry hey, what is this <laughs> is it, it? <laughs> so krishna he is expert at everything and he is expert even at provocation <laughs> if krishna wants to make us angry you know he can just press all the buttons he is omniscient he just knows how to make someone angry <laughs> so here now why would krishna do that now why would krishna provoke indra like that so there is a reason you see all of us in normal situations we all can behave in we can all put our good face in front we can all behave like gentlemen and ladies when things are going on normally but it is when we are provoked that the side of us that we keep concealed it comes out so it is said that provocations introduce us to us provocations also introduce us to others of course it's not that the that who we are when we are provoked is the complete us but it is also not the who we are in normal situations is the complete us so you can say provocations bring out our lower side bring out our dark side it brings out the side of us which we normally keep concealed now at one level such concealing is not necessarily bad uh, this uh, difference between the internal and the external that is there in everyone mm -hmm. at how what we think what we desire and how we act there is a gap between the two this is not necessarily a bad thing it's also a sign of a civilized society that whatever impulses whatever desires that come up within us we don't act on them we cannot see each other's thoughts and that is a great blessing <laughs> if we started seeing each other's thoughts desires craving they you think like that about me you have that kind of desires these are the kind of fantasies you entertain if we all started seeing each other's hearts we all started seeing each other's thoughts not a single relationship could be sustained so nature has given us a buffer by which many things might come and come up might occur inside us but our thoughts remain invisible till they manifest the physical world. and by that what happens is we all can behave in a cultured way of course now this difference between external and internal at one level it we could say it's a it's a sign of a cultured or a civilized society but we have to understand what is the intention over here the intention could be that i act in a civilized way so that i actually become civilized that means it's a discipline okay 
I, I I don't I don't I don't want to be like a uncouth person who yells at others. Although I'm feeling like doing that right now, but I'll control myself. And gradually, my anger will also come under control. So this gap can be because we are disciplined, and gradually we might remove the dark within us. Or the gap could be if it's on the discipline side, it's it's good. it's positive by discipline will lead to purification on the negative side it could be because of hypocrisy that means we want to act in a cultured way so till the other person lets their guard down and the moment they let their guard down we pounce on them so somebody is very greedy and they want to steal money but say somebody from whom they want to steal money they drop some pennies they drop some notes And you go and give it back, you know. And when you do that, oh, you're such a trustworthy person. So you act as if you have no greed for the other person. So you give back the small, small amounts, and the other person lowers the guard, and then you steal a big amount. <laughs> so this gap between the external and internal, why that is, that is something which each person has to introspect within their heart. That gap will be there for all of us unless we are pure devotees. then we could say that outside inside is entirely the same but the point here is that we all have some darkness within us now with with that darkness also there are limits that means when i get angry when i get greedy when any of these anartha start coming within us when they express themselves also to what extent will someone go when they express them that will vary from person to person some people when they get angry they might just grind their teeth and then, you know that is, you can see that nerves swelling over here and everywhere and they are clenching their fist there is some restrained physical expression for some people when they get angry then it's like the tongue loses whatever break it has <laughs> and um, just speak anything and everything it's a verbal assault it's like a verbal machine gun it's like a, you know in america there's a lot of concern because many people have guns i was in a college i was giving a talk and i was giving a talk i turned to look at the slide and to explain i looked there was nobody in the class i said what happened and then somebody pulled me off the chair so what had happened there was a gun alert and everybody had dug under the <laughs> everybody had dug under the chair and one of them came to me you also dug under the chair <laughs> so later on they turned out that it was actually a test to check whether people comply or not there was no gun, no gunman over there but they wanted to check whether people comply or not <laughs> but anyway so if somebody has a gun and they can be very dangerous they can if they they can just go around and shoot and kill many people so if somebody is carrying a gun they have to be very cautious so actually we all carry a gun within us and that is our tongue the tongue can shoot shoot and shoot you know when we get angry we can deliver the best speech that we will ever regret <laughs> Actually anger make anger can make some people very articulate. Now they just express themselves and I I have this issue I am because I'm a writer I'm quite articulate. So I can I can analyze issues very well but when I want to criticize I can criticize also very bitingly. So I have to be very careful about it. But anyway the point is that there are different levels of aggression I'm talking about. so somebody might become verbally aggressive you know some people might become physically aggressive you know, they might take some things and throw at each other some people might not just take things they will throw throw may punch face punch at someone some people might take a knife and attack someone some people might take a gun and attack someone so basically all these are different degrees now all of us have anger but based on our culture based on our upbringing based on our conscience even when we get angry 
there will be certain limits within which we will express our anger. There are certain things which you might do, but there are certain things which we will not do. So, now what are the limits for someone? That also reveals their their character, their personality, their the substance of who they are. So now Krishna, Krishna wanted to expose how deep was the pride of Indra. So Krishna provoked. So sometimes provocations, as I said, what happens? Provocations introduce us to us. And us to us means or introduce us to others, but it that the dark side of us which we conceal normally. When we are provoked, it comes out. So now we all have a dark side, but how dark is the dark side? That we can come to know under provocation. How dark is the dark side within us, or how dark is the dark side in someone else? So go Indra, because he was the king of gods. He was in a respectable and worshipable position and his pride was not so immediately visible to anyone. Yeah, of course he's in a respectable position, he is to be respected. So somebody like even the spiritual master might be sitting on a big asana and doing the pa Pada Puja might be happening. But that doesn't necessarily mean they are proud. Some spiritual master could, can also become proud. But, but just the if somebody is in an external respectable position, does not necessarily mean that they are proud. So in devotee culture, it is a culture of offering, res offering respect and honor to each other. So <clears throat> in a devotee culture, how do we practice humility? So at one side you are told to be humble, but another time you also told offer respect to each other. So if everybody offers respect to us, how do we stay humble then? So actually humility means to accept honor, but to not expect honor. That means if somebody offers us respect, we accept it. Not because we deserve it, but because Krishna has put us in a position where the culture makes us receive that. We accept that. But if we start expecting it, so if I come into the temple and I look, who all are bowing down to me? Who is not bowing down to me? Offender. If somebody starts thinking like that, there is very little Krishna consciousness in their, their conduct. So if somebody offers respect, we accept it. But humility means we don't expect it. And certainly, we don't demand it. Some people, their very behavior is, they act like a pure devotee. It's almost like they are carrying a marker on their forehead. Pure devotee, offer dandavat. <laughs> <laughs> they speak very advanced leelas of Krishna. They act as if they are very, very advanced. And then, you see that actually they are all craving for, they are all like doing all this to crave for honor. That is unfortunate. But the point I am making is, Indra was respected. Now just because somebody is receiving respect or somebody is being given uh, or somebody is taking honor, that does not necessarily mean, some of you can come ahead, there is a lot of space here. I don't know, many of you behind are struggling to, maybe you are struggling to see me, I am also struggling to see you. If you want, you can come ahead. You can move the chairs ahead also if you like. Yeah. So, uh, how do we know when somebody is, uh, is proud? It is in a provoking situation. So what Krishna is doing, sometimes if somebody is proud, because of their behavior, because they are in a respectable position, others may not, may or may not recognize that this person has become proud. And you know, there are different levels of, you could say, deception. Sometimes we deceive others. But sometimes in our, at, our attempt at deceiving others is so convincing that we end up deceiving ourselves. That means, Sometimes we tell lies knowing that it is a lie. Sometimes we tell a lie believing that it is the truth. The human mind can work in such a way that sometimes uh, some people can, uh, some honest people can speak untruths. And it is not that they are being manipulative. It's just the way the mind works. 
often what happens the bad that has happened to us we have a long memory about it and the bad that has been done by us we have a short memory about it so that's why when we tell something about how it happened it might appear as if we are blameless now it's not that we sometimes we might do it intentionally but sometimes we might just do it it just happens so okay so the point i'm making here is that sometimes somebody might be proud but even they themselves might not realize they are proud so somebody might be greedy but they themselves might not realize that they are greedy so some sometimes like chaitanya mahaprabhu says the weeds that grow they are sometimes exactly identical to the bhakti the creeper of devotion they just can't identify it so if somebody is getting a lot of money or somebody is getting a lot of honor say now whether they are taking it for themselves or they are taking it for as representatives of krishna on krishna's behalf we don't know we can't know in advance and sometimes not only can others not know sometimes that, that person also it's difficult to know uh, <coughs> if say once uh, one of the senior spiritual masters in a moment he was asked about the same question that we are told to be humble but then devotees glorify us so much so how do we maintain our humility so maharaj said that the maharaj said that actually prabhu you are so glorious that we all should glorify you in fact if we don't glorify you we will fall down and then he added but if you believe that glorification you will fall down <laughs> so the idea is that it's a culture so does it mean that it's lies it's not lies if somebody is doing something glorious we recognize that but we understand that i am an instrument i am not the cause so i am grateful that krishna is using me as an instrument but if i start taking sole credit for what i am doing then i'll become proud so the point is that sometimes we may have some anartha and we ourselves may not realize that we have that anartha but when we are provoked that is the time the anartha within comes out and even the magnitude of the anartha how much it is that comes out so what happened in the case of indra was that he krishna wanted indra to realize for himself how much pride he had got how arrogant he had become because of Uh, his position, how much of an we could say a mentality of entitlement he had got in today's parlance. Actually, it's a it's a difficult uh, question to answer universally, but it seems that the nature of humanity is that a certain amount of deprivation. is essential for motivation if we are living in a very comfortable situation it is very difficult to be motivated mm. a certain amount of deprivation motivates us so and when that deprivation is not there when there is abundance then the motivation may go down so for example uh, this i read about surveys in america this might be true in uk also that generally if immigrants come to a country then they because they left their home and they come to a distant place they work very hard to build their career so on an average say if asians in generally indians americans people on in the subcontinent they do very well in academics i mean i, I was at ivy league university and in fact there's a case against harvard right now because what is happening is they have to have they want to have diversity they say if we leave everything to merit the whole harvard will be filled with only indians and chinese people <laughs> because they so brilliant but then what is happening sometimes highly qualified there's a highly qualified indian boy you know super qualified he did not get into harvard and now his parents have made a case against and now many asians many indians chinese have joined to again okay, for that case so the point is that in general say if immigrants have come So if students come to a different country for studying then their motivation level is very high 
I have left the home, I have come here to study. And as compared to the natives, they excel far, far more. But then if they settle down, this advantage which immigrant, immigrant students have over native students, that more or less disappears in three generations. That means if somebody has been in say America for three generations and say they are Indians, but if they are kids, they don't have that level of motivation. So the, they may be good naturally, genetically they may be gifted, but that zeal that goes down. So a certain level of deprivation is sometimes necessary for motivation. And uh, abundance of provisions can actually make us complacent, can actually weaken us. So sometimes if we don't get honor, if we regularly are honored, that might take away our motivation. So now what is the exact level of deprivation? Now if somebody is too deprived, they might just become discouraged, disheartened and just quit. So what is optimal that will vary from person to person, situation to situation. But in the case of Indra, what happened was that he had so much honor that it went to his head. And even he didn't realize it. So at one level, because he's in a, respect, he's a respectable position, he's expected to be honored. But he's also not expected to know that this is not just for me. He forgot that. And Krishna wanted to reveal to Indra how much this pride, this craving for respect had dominated him. And that is why Krishna provoked him. So Krishna's provocation, so I talked about Indra's psychology uh, and then I'm talking about also Krishna's psychology. So actually it was an outrageous thing, an absurd and outrageous thing from Indra's perspective. What happened? And why did Krishna do something absurd we could say? But Krishna had his purpose. And when we look at it from a limited perspective, Sometimes some situations come in our life that just don't make sense. You may pray to Krishna for something and something just the opposite of that happens. So we say, is Krishna answering my prayers or what is going on? So we have thought of a path in our life and we pray to Krishna, Krishna please remove the obstacles from this path. And we pray and suddenly a bigger obstacle than what we had thought of it comes up over there. Hey, what's, what's going on? Now we see the road up to a particular point. But Krishna sees the road through and through. So what might seem like a barrier for us, but there might be a big ditch, there might be a big marsh, there might be a big swamp over there ahead. We can't see it. So what appears to be like a barrier for us with our finite vision can from a bigger perspective appear to be, turn out to be a protector. But we can't see it at that time. So sometimes when uh, Krishna seems, uh, things seem to be happening in such a way that they're just, just one thing after another, after another seems to be provoking us, seem to be frustrating us. Say, where is Krishna? What is going on? Now Krishna does have a plan. So Krishna had a plan and Indra, he got provoked. <clears throat> it was... Every, Krishna decided to, when, as I said, when Krishna decided to provoke Indra, Indra, he just got so provoked. <coughs> Generally, one principle of justice is that the, the punishment should be proportionate to the crime, not proportionate to the outrage felt at the crime. If somebody has done something wrong and nobody knows about it, nobody complains about it and they are punished a little bit but somebody does something wrong and then the whole media comes to know about it. Nowadays in social media, you know, what might catch attention, what might become viral, we don't know. If something becomes viral and then somebody has done something wrong and everybody condemns them and sometimes the, the government also, the judges or whoever get carried away, then they might punish the person far more than what is normal because in response to the outrage. So generally, 
justice even if somebody has done something wrong the punishment has to be proportional to the the crime whatever it is but here we see indra's anger leads to in it's take like a sequence his pride is there so generally pride basically what does it mean it means an uh, entitlement mentality that i deserve this honor and if i don't get it so just see pride is also a desire lust is also a desire it is it said that the ego what we desire by that is fall is like subtle sex what it means is in lust we desire a physical object for gratification in pride we desire a subtler object for gratification that is praise honor position distinction now just as uh, kama has a anuja who is kama anuja that you know anuja is a younger brother so anger krodha kama anuja like we have rama anuja acharya so rama anuja is actually said to be lakshman the younger brother of ram so kam anuja is krodha that means where there is strong craving when that craving is not fulfilled anger will come jayato vishayan pumsa sangaste shu pajayate sangat sanjayate kamah kama krodho bijayate so desire leads to anger and similarly pride is also a desire for something subtler for for honor so when pride just as when lust is frustrated it lead to anger pride also when frustrated leads to anger and then indra's anger comes out and that anger is out he is outraged by what has happened but anger indra's anger is outrageously disproportional it is like say now i give the earlier example say if somebody supposed to deserve to supposed to be served food and instead you give some, somebody else the food it's you can understand that person get angry but suppose that person gets so angry that person takes a machine gun and starts shooting everyone around <laughs> how dare you take away my food <laughs> you know, that's that's outrageous so indra you could say was you, yes he could have got angry at what happened but what did he do he just unleashed the fiercest powers at his disposal the fiercest powers he started showering torrential rains not only rains he started seeing fierce storms scary lightning horrifying thunderbolts the like combined wrath of nature just descended on govardhan it's like suppose you, there are some heads of state today who are notorious to be uh, notorious to be uncontrolled so you know somebody insults that person and that person just because of some countries another country's head insults him and because of that this person sends nuclear weapons on their country and destroys the whole country that's completely out of proportion so indra he uses all the celestial power at his uh, at his command to destroy vrindavan to destroy vrindavan completely and uh, it's 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 shocking how far he can go okay he's dishonored it's okay yeah you can understand you get angry but to what extent if we consider the devtas are also not free from faults the devtas also have lust they also have greed they also have anger but generally the dev that the difference between the devtas and the demons are the devtas live within limits the devtas also say have apsaras they also have celestial de- delights in heavens but the devtas don't go and abduct other women uh, uh, abduct uh, abduct women the so they also have that those desires but it's within limits whereas the asuras when the desires come they go beyond limits so actually in a sense dharma is about many things dharma is about both the dharma is both a bond and a boundary a bond means this is how i should act 
a boundary means beyond this i should not act so like we have when we take initiation the bond is chant 16 rounds the boundary is follow the regs follow the four regs so dharma is both a bond and a boundary the bond is how we should act the boundary is how we should not act and general devtas live within dharma and we talk about the boundaries all of us uh, need certain boundaries actually we need to protect uh, we need to protect the fences that protect us whatever it may be every culture society has certain norms of behavior and if people act according to those within those norms then things move forward so what happens with indra is that his anger becomes completely disproportionate and it's not just disproportionate in terms of what he is using to express the anger it's disproportionate in terms of who he is targeting also he is not just targeting krishna he is targeting all the vrajavasis Wants to destroy all of Rindavan, and this is extremely dangerous. So, for all of us, when we are provoked, what we do or what we can do reveals the dark side within us. And at one level, sometimes we may hear about Indra and how he acted. He says, "You know, what an arrogant person he is," or we see the characters in scripture. and he's like hey what kind of person is this how could they act like this so but the, it's not just they can act like that any of us can act like that so in one sense we need to have prabhupad said have a healthy fear of maya so another way it could be that we need to be terrified of how terrible we can be so that we never become that terrible be terrified of how terrible you can be that means sometimes we see in even a devotee circle some devotee does something and we think how can a devotee act like that that's that's reprehensible now of course if something is a wrong or terrible action it's a terrible action but instead of simply uh, there is a word otherify otherify means treat the person like other as if you know this what kind of species is this I don't know who this is. Instead of instead of treating the person like that, what kind of person will do like that? We understand that actually, look, in if provoked, if this devotee could act like this, maybe I can also act like that. So I never want to be like that. So be terrified of how terrible we can be, so that we are never that we never become that terrible. so indra shows us that negative example indra is not a bad person he is he is a devta and he is also a, he is a good person overall but even when we are good and there is a dark side within us sometimes we let the dark side grow and grow and grow but we continue to living living a good life but if we are not fighting against the dark side we are letting it grow letting it grow eventually it will express itself in ugly way and how ugly it may be it can be horrifying so what indra is what this story reveals is how krishna introduces indra to his dark side so that he can get rid of that dark side so how he gets rid of that dark side we will discuss after the break i'll quickly summarize till now what i spoke and we have a few questions before we go for julan so i spoke on this theme today of how krishna is expert at everything so he is expert at provoking also so krishna does something outrageous and from indra we talk from psychological perspective indra's anger was entirely justified and he was outrageously snubbed the worship that was meant for him was given to something utterly insignificant like a hill like the food which is meant to be given to a very respectable person you go to somebody utterly unknown so anything like that so he and not only that krishna used a a false logic to do that 
So like if you lie, at least tell a believable lie. So Krishna didn't even do that. So that was even more provoking. So now it's understandable that Indra got provoked. Now why did Krishna provoke like this? Because that was the elaborate part of the class that we all we all have a dark side within us. In normal situations, we behave in a cultured way, and that gap is good if we are doing it as a discipline so that we become purified. But that gap can also be because of hypocrisy. We are concealing the dark so that we can we can pounce and others lower their guard. Now we might be somewhere in between. So so when provocations come, then the dark within us pops out. And at that time, how dark is the dark within us? We come to know. So adversity, uh, provocations introduce us to ourselves, introduce others, us to others. So, so sometimes the anarthas are such that others can't detect them. As it's honor, uh, humility means we may accept honor, but we don't expect honor. But when somebody is expecting honor, how do you know? So sometimes others cannot detect the anartha. Sometimes we might deceive ourselves so much that we believe our lies. And then we also don't know the presence of the anartha. That's when if a provocation comes, then the anartha comes out. And I talked about how when the anartha comes out, based on our culture, there will be limits within which we express it. So I might just yell at someone and I'm angry or somebody might take a machine gun and kill someone and they're angry. So how much is the anger within one someone that is revealed when they are provoked. So dharma is both a bond about how we should act and a boundary. About even when we are provoked, don't go beyond this, how we should not act. So Krishna provoked Indra and then Indra used just still, even if we are angry, justice has to be proportionate to the crime, not the proportion to the outrage felt at the crime. Indra used all his celestial power to exterminate everyone in Vrindavan, exterminate Vrindavan itself. And that was utterly disproportionate. So rather than otherifying Indra, we understand that this is how terrible even we can become. And we need to be terrified of how terrible we can be so that we never become that terrible. Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Do we have time? Permission? We have time for questions? Take a break for 15 minutes because the Juna is starting now. Okay. Okay, so 7.20, 7.25? 7.20. So we will have questions at that time. And Yeah, expert, expert, yes. Yeah, anyway, seven